The main reason for this Redux video is because yesterday, Seth Sarkowski released a video on the D&D C2 The Ghost Tower of Inverness module. I have noticed that when much bigger YouTubers release reviews of D&D modules, my video reviews of the same modules have a chance to appear in the recommendations column. Yay! However, many of my earlier videos have received criticism on my robot-like voice, which, I admit, is not a good first impression. So, I hope the YouTube algorithm will start recommending this version of my walkthrough of the C2 module. Okay, so let me start all over again. Hello, and greetings to all you fans of RPGs and of Dungeons & Dragons. This is RPG Mods Fan, and in this video, I will be reviewing and discussing the Dungeons & Dragons module C2 Ghost Tower of Inverness, which was written by Alan Hammack and published by TSR in 1980. This module was meant for player characters between the levels of 5 to 7. This module was written for AD&D 1st edition rules. Although some work may be needed, the Dungeon Master should not have too much trouble to convert it to 5th edition rules. As background history, it was originally written as a tournament module for WinterCon 8, which was held in Detroit in November of 1979. Due to its tournament origins, the C2 module is categorized as a funhouse dungeon. A funhouse dungeon is more about weird, spectacular, and crazy encounters than it is about a dungeon ecology that actually works. Like most people, when I hear the name Inverness, I think of the real-life county of Inverness in Scotland. As FYI, the Ness River flows through the city of Inverness. Further up the river is a lake called Loch Ness. Inverness has plenty of ghostly towers, such as Inverness Castle and Cawdor Castle. The TV and film actress Karen Gillan is a native of and was born in Inverness, Scotland. And yes, I do have a crush on her. However, the author of the module, Alan Hammack, is originally from Alabama. He was probably thinking of the Inverness neighborhood in Birmingham. This adventure takes place in the fantasy world of Greyhawk, in the southwestern region of the Duchy of Ernst. Specifically, in the foothills of the Abor Alls, on a rocky outcropping overlooking the Woolly Bay. I want to give credit to Captain Courageous. He also did a review of the C2 module and posted it on his YouTube channel in March of 2018. In a few parts of this video, I will mimic what he does in his. To Captain Courageous, if you are watching, please consider this as the highest form of flattery. The opening of the C2 module reads like that of the opening of a Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian story. Know you that in the elder days, before the invoked devastation and the reign of colorless fire, when the ancient peaks of the Abor Alls still thrust skyward sharp and majestic, 
and the Flan tribesmen were but newcomers to the land. There existed between the bright desert and the mouth of the river Salentine a great fortress called Inverness. Know you also that here was said to dwell the great wizard Gallop Tridel at the height of his power and glory, and that he did lift the castle Inverness from the very foundation of rock upon which it rested. Most grand and terrible of all Gallop Tridel's work was the keep's great inner tower, for it was there that the wizard's most prized possession, an eldritch jewel known only as the soul gem, was said to rest. At the beginning of this module, the player characters will know the following stuff, or they can easily learn this knowledge from the locals. Long ago, the wizard Gallop Drydel built a stone castle. Within the center of the castle, he built a tall tower to house the soul gem. Quite some time afterwards, the castle was laid siege upon, and the center tower was reduced to rubble. Now, most everyone shuns the area. Some swear that, during fog-shrouded nights, the great central tower could still be seen. The seer of Ernst has convinced Justinian Lorinar, who was the duke and the ruler of Ernst, to send an expedition to the ruins to search for and find the soul gem. In the tournament version of this module, where pre-generated characters are used, with the exception of one monk, the expedition is comprised of criminals, where they are given the choice of either finding the soul gem or being executed. My preference is for the players to use their own characters, so the dungeon master should come up with a plot hook that fits their campaign world. I will now be discussing the module itself and this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a dungeon master who will be running this module for their players, or are a player who already played through this module and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. The Soul Gem is a plot device for the module. In literature, this is known as the MacGuffin. As mentioned before, the tournament version of the module uses pre-generated characters who are criminals compelled to finding the soul gem. If your players are using their own characters, then here is an idea for the DM. Have the pre-generated characters as NPCs that the player characters can meet. Better yet, have the player characters hired by a rival country to the Duchy of Ernst, or a rival noble within the Duke's court to seek the Soul Gem. Hence, the pre-generated characters can be used as a rival party who are also seeking the gem. As you can tell, I am the type of dungeon master that likes to thicken the plots. Whether by compulsion or by choice, the player characters journey to the ruins of Keep Inverness. Since there is quite a distance between the capital of the Duchy of Ernst and the ruins, the DM can throw in a side quest or two during their travels. That is why I like the adventures in Dungeon Magazine. Many of them can be used as side quests. With some tweaking, they can be modified to fit the narrative of the Dungeon Master's campaign world. The Ruins Keep stands high on a hilltop. Its massive walls anchored deep in the rock upon which they rest. The walls of the keep are 50 feet or 15 meters tall and 8 feet or 
two and a half meters thick, with numerous crumbling holes piercing them at various places. An enormous pile of rubble, 20 feet or 6 meters tall, lies in the center of the courtyard. This is all that remains of the once large central tower. Entry to the dungeon level is possible from any one of the four circular towers at the corners of the keep. During the course of this adventure, the player characters will need to go through each of these towers. The first objective of the player characters is to find and join four parts of a key. Each part of the key is a blue-gray rectangular bar with a circle on one end. Put together, the key will allow access to the trans-dimensional and trans-temporal tower of Inverness. The four parts of the key are located on the dungeon level and lie in the rooms indicated on the screen. For now, the center room, labeled room number 15, is inaccessible to the player characters. Also, notice that some of the rooms are blank. The Dungeon Master is free to fill in these rooms however they see fit. The dungeon level of the ruined castle is not too sturdy. Cave-ins and collapses will occur from the use of fireball and lightning bolt spells. One of the key parts is located in a room that has a stone sarcophagus, and the room is filled with what appears to be 16 unmoving bugbears. The bugbears are in temporal stasis. Four bugbears will animate each time either of the two entrance ways is used to enter the room. The stone sarcophagus contains the key part along with some treasure, mostly coins and some gems, and nothing else. Although cheesy and cliché, as a dungeon master, I love adding and placing a mummy in the sarcophagus. My players mockingly said to me, A mummy? Really? A mummy? I responded, Yes, a mummy. Now, everyone, roll for initiative. I got a few laughs out of those who had a sense of humor. Another key part is located in a rubble-filled room that is also a layer of a manticore. From an ecology perspective, this room does not make any sense. This room is a 15 by 15 meter square with a 6 meter high ceiling. Not enough room for a manticore to be flying around in. Also, how does the manticore leave its lair to go out hunting? As a DM, I would add a tunnel that leads to the outside. From the outside, this proposed tunnel would be discoverable by the player characters if they are rock climbing along the western face of the hill that the keep is standing on. Four irregularly shaped tunnels open into this room. Within this rectangular room is a treasure chest filled with coin and a key part. Within a round, an umber hulk will appear. As stated before, this module was meant for player characters between the levels of 5 to 7. At those levels, an umber hulk can be quite a challenge. This corridor ends with five human-shaped indentations in the wall. When a person steps into an indentation, they will be transported via mechanical means to the next room. The floor of this room resembles a chessboard. At the other end of this room is a two-meter-tall statue. 
the player character must cross the room by moving in accordance to the chess piece they initially started as when they first entered this room. Otherwise, whenever they deviate, they will receive 5 hit points of damage with no saving throw. The key part is hidden in a secret compartment of the statue's chest, which can be opened by grasping the statue's hand. By opening the southern door of this room will trigger an illusion of a giant stone ball rolling quickly towards the player characters. Given that the ball needs to make a number of 90 degree turns in order to keep rolling seems, to me, a little ridiculous. Maybe that is what the author intended. Maybe this is the author's way of giving a clue that this ball is an illusion. Anyway, this giant stone rolling ball scenario resembles a scene out of an Indiana Jones movie. By the way, the C2 module was released in 1980. A year later, the first Indiana Jones movie was released. So, I cannot say the module ripped a scene from Indiana Jones. Instead, it seems Indiana Jones ripped its scene from this module. Although the map shows double doors at each side of the central chamber, to the player characters approaching it, it seems the corridor ends in a gleaming wall of blue-gray metal smooth enough to reflect their forms as they approach, no matter which direction they approach from. In the center of each of the walls is a square channel with circular corners cut into the surface of the metal. The key parts may be joined into one key and then placed into the indentation or placed one at a time into the sides of the square. When the indentation is filled, a line appears at the center of the blank wall and then divides into two halves. Opening into a 12 by 12 meter square room. The walls, floor, and ceiling are all made of the same smooth blue-gray metal. The room has eight thickly padded reclining chairs. When the last of the player characters enter the chamber, the so-called doors of the room will slam shut and the characters have 10 seconds to lie on one of the reclining chairs. Everyone will then feel they are being slammed to the ground. Anyone not reclining on a chair will take 1d8 damage. A 5 foot or 1.5 meter diameter hole will then appear on the ceiling that is 10 feet or 3 meters above. The central chamber was a time portal. It transports the player characters eons into the past when the great central tower was still standing in the castle. Moving upwards through the tower, the player characters will discover five levels. One for each of the four elements, air, earth, fire, and water. And finally, the great domed jewel room in which the soul gem is kept. For those wondering how the player characters will return to their own time, at the beginning of the adventure, when they were meeting with Duke Justinian Lorinar, they were given an amulet of recall. This amulet acts as a dos ex machina device that will bring the characters back to their own time at the conclusion of this adventure. The first level of the tower is the air level. Here, there is a warm, thick, rolling mist. There are two encounters at this level. One is a Hierako Sphinx. The other 
are three tyrannodons. A spiral winding iron staircase leads up to the next level. The second level of the tower is the earth level. Here there is a dense forest. A total of three Sioux monsters can be encountered. In a clearing, with her back turned towards the player characters, wearing a hooded robe, singing in a sweet melody, a Medusa is tending a garden of roses. There are no statues here. As a DM, I feel that a Medusa's lair should have her petrified victims in it. So, I would add a few petrified creatures, but are hidden in the dense plant growth of this level. If you like my idea of using the pre-generated characters as a rival party to the players, then have one of the pre-gen characters petrified in the clearing with the Medusa. Unfortunately, having such a statue here gives away the danger the player characters are about to face. At the third level of the tower, the player characters will see stone pathways before them. At the same time, this level seems to be a sea of fire. Across this large circular chamber, the player characters will also see another spiral iron staircase, but standing next to it is a fire giant. The staircase is false and leads nowhere. The fire giant will start hurling boulders at the player characters, then switch to his sword when they are in melee range. The large stone sarcophagus Behind the fire giant has a lot of copper pieces, a large bejeweled platinum crown, and a ring of feather falling. Again, just to be cheesy and cliche, I would place a mummy within the sarcophagus. The fire giant is not the only monster the characters will face. Emerging from the sea of fire, will be a dozen or so fire bats. Fire bats make their debut as a new monster to the D&D world in this module. At the center of the chamber is a reverse gravity area. Anyone stepping into the area will fall towards the ceiling where there is a 10 foot or a three meter diameter hole where the characters can then fall into the next level of the tower. If you are using the pre-generated characters as rivals, then I would say they manage to reach the reverse gravity area and escape. The entire water level is under a huge reverse gravity effect. Basically up becomes down and down becomes up. Those who fell into the water may not only sustain falling damage, but also risk drowning, especially if they are wearing heavy armor and or encumbered by heavy inventory. The salty sea green warm water is four and a half meters deep. There is also a sandy beach island here with two palm trees. Swimming in the waters is a denicthes. The other hazard swimming in these waters is a pack of 10 Ixitza Chittal. Hope I said that right. To reach the next and final level of the tower, the player characters need to open a hatchway at the deepest part of the water. Gravity reverts to normal as the player characters go up the chute. In this 120 foot or 36 and a half meter diameter circular chamber with a 50 foot or 15 meter high domed ceiling at its center, the player characters will see the MacGuffin, the object of their quest. In other words, they see the soul gem, which is floating 
and slowly rotating. Every round via 1D8 roll by the Dungeon Master, the gem will emit a dazzling white ray which will completely fill one of the eight wedge-shaped sections of the room. Characters in the wedge where the gem's blast is occurring must make a saving throw or their soul gets sucked into the gem. A 20 hit point invisible force field surrounds the gem. The module is considered concluded when the characters are able to grab the gem and activate the Amulet of Recall. If you are using the pre-generated characters as rivals, then I would have the final confrontation with them here in this room. Because the shape of the tower resembles a sci-fi spaceship, I am tempted to combine the C2 module with the S3 module expedition to the Barrier Peaks. Just an idea that I'm throwing out there. Other than being a powerful wizard and the one who built the Ghost Tower, not much else is discussed about Gallup Drydell. The dungeons within White Plume Mountain in the S2 module was also built by a powerful wizard. Just as another idea to throw out there, Gallup Drydell is a distant relative of this wizard. This same line of wizards built these funhouse dungeons throughout the lands. Also, a powerful wizard is a convenient explanation for dungeons that do not make sense when looked from an ecological perspective. As you can tell, I am the type of dungeon master that likes to link modules together in some form of an overall arcing campaign. The drawings, maps, and art of the C2 module were done by Jeff D., David S. LaForce, Jim Rosloff, Errol Otos, David C. Sutherland III, and Bill Willingham. Roll credits? Displayed are the credits found within the module itself. The C2 module receives good ratings on both Amazon's and DriveThruRPG's websites, averaging a 4.3 out of 5 stars between the both of them. There were a number of customer comments. None of them I found add anything new to what I have already discussed in this video. However, on screen, I am displaying two comments that may be worth reading. I would pause the video here if you wish to read them. Thank you for watching. Hope this video has been informative and entertaining. I love many types of role-playing games, especially Dungeons & Dragons. Inclusive in my wayward love is computer role-playing games such as Divinity Original Sin 1 and 2, the first two Dragon Age games, Baldur's Gate, Dragon's Dogma, and others. In the foreseeable future for this channel, I plan on continuing to review D&D modules. Till next time, this is RPG Mods Fan saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye. Open eye Through the waves cut through me Hypnotized By the sounds I'm breathing in Hold tight, hold tight Chemicals collide Hold tight, hold tight Hold tight Dripping lights Paint the skies All because of you Paint the sky